Chapter 2. The TV van accelerates past me. It squeals to a stop just beyond the point where the path meets the sidewalk. A second van swings into a driveway, backs out, and speeds off in the opposite direction. It's heading for the other end of the perp walk link to catch me on camera coming out, or even better, disappearing en route. The first camera crew is setting up just past the perp walk mouth. A woman snaps a mic cord like it is snagged on something important. She primps. If I get within range of the perp walk, I'll be photographed or videotaped, and that will be interpreted as me trying to travel through time, trying to reconstitute my botched life, doing exactly what they hoped I would do. I turn around and head back south. The house is that way, they all call to me. Rick Dawkins falls in step beside me. Want a lift, he asks. Every step takes me farther from home. No questions, I say. Deal. We run for his car. He speeds north on Chapman. At a street where we should turn left, Rick Dawkins goes right. Hey, I say, throwing them off. He turns left on Holt Street. They know where you live, he says. I'm planting seeds of doubt. I don't say anything. Like Johnny Appleseed, he adds. Still I say nothing. Isn't that the Waters house, he asks innocently as we blow by it? Of course it is. My daughter is forbidden by court order to come within 500 feet of Corey Waters or his home. Penny's insistence that she and Corey had been in love freaked out the kid at the same time that it sort of flattered him, being pursued by a cute psycho chick. His girlfriend, whose name is Reagan, got tired of Penny dropping over and blew off Penny's insistence that she and Reagan had been friends once too. It was Corey's mother, Margaret Waters, who went to the police. Corey attended the hearing, but his mother did all the talking. Rick Dawkins had been checking his notes on another story in the back row of the courtroom, and he was, he later told me, just about to leave. If Penny had waited 60 seconds to speak, I would have missed the biggest story of my career, he told me later. Like Robert Redford getting up to leave just before Watergate broke. Then Penny was asked her witness of the events that Margaret Waters claimed amounted to the stalking of her son. I was present to show support for my daughter, but I was curious, too, about her take on the time that we had both lived through. Corey and I were boyfriend and girlfriend, Penny said in a clear, compelling voice. I thought we were in love. Maybe we weren't. It was an insane summer all around, the summer my dad and I traveled through time. A sort of shiver went through the few people present. Did you say traveled through time, the judge asked? All the kids were trying it too, Penny continued. Holly Dearborn actually made it. She went into the future and came back. Miss Winkler, the judge interrupted sternly, you're in a court of law. Penny said, don't I know it. This is neither the time nor the place for a teenage prank. Your Honor, this is so not a teenage prank, Penny said. Holly came back from the future and she told me Corey would cheat on me. I tried to be cool, but I failed. I threw myself at him. I even jumped naked into a swimming pool. Corey Waters couldn't keep his eyes off Penny now. I realized I was being an idiot, she told the judge. I jumped out of the pool, gathered up my clothes and ran home. Or I tried to. I wound up in 1918 instead. A roar of voices commenced. Corey, his mom, his friends, lawyers, a bailiff, and a court reporter. The judge had been expecting so little drama in the case that he had to dig through a drawer to find his gavel so he could wrap it. I looked around the courtroom. Behind me sat scribbling Rick Dawkins. Farther back was a muscular young man in a tight muscle shirt, buzz-cut black hair, and a pierced eyebrow, intently studying Penny. I would learn soon enough that this young man was named Randall. Did you say 1918, the judge asked? Yes, Penny said. I took a job in an orphanage. I tried to come back to now, but I couldn't. People were dying of the Spanish influenza. Then my dad showed up. In 1918, the judge said. When Penny nodded, he continued. Is your father in the courtroom, or is he still back in 1918? Penny looked at me. I raised my hand. Please stand up, sir. Rick Dawkins came forward and dropped into the row across from me. You claim also to have gone back to 1918, the judge asked. Uh, yes, sir. How does one travel through time back to 1918? There are walkways. You walked? Ran, actually. And why did you go back to 1918? To save my daughter. You knew she was there, the judge said. It was in the papers back then, her death announcement. She doesn't look dead to me. No, she got back in time before she caught the flu. Lucky for her, the judge said. Yes, sir. So you see her death notice in the 1918 paper, and then you just go to 1918, the judge said? How does that work? I seem to go where I need to go. Down special sidewalks, the judge said. I nodded. And where are these special sidewalks? In Euclid Heights, the east side of Euclid Heights specifically. Specifically, the judge repeated. 
At last he bade me sit. Continue, he told Penny. So, I was in 1918, and my father showed up, she said. There was a sheriff, you know, back then. He owned the orphanage where I worked. His grandson was my dad's, would be, was supposed to be, my dad's big mortal enemy. The sheriff wanted me to stay. I was good with the kids. Later, he got a little creepy. Creepy, the judge said. Penny nodded. He was a lot older than I am, she said, even in 1918. I see, the judge said. So I came home. Back, Penny said. By running, the judge asked. Penny nodded. And then what happened, he asked. Everything had changed, she said, her voice catching so faintly only I noticed. My dad was married to someone else. My real mom didn't know me. She'd had kids, just not me. My uncle, who'd been brain damaged, wasn't. And Corey, none of my friends knew who I was. The judge addressed me. Mr. Winkler, what became of your mortal enemy? He doesn't exist, Your Honor. Did you do something to his grandfather in 1918? I talked to him. I probably shouldn't have. Probably, the judge said. Your presence in the past altered events, and now a person doesn't exist in the present. Yes, sir. I guess so, although there's no proof that the judge interrupted me. Your daughter doesn't exist either. She does to me. Fortunately for me in this court and our entire system of justice, but mostly for me, he said, the fantasy you have spun here doesn't require a ruling by me. As to the matter before us, for whatever reason, Penny Winkler can't stay away from this young man. It is her misfortune that he does not desire her attentions. That is his right. Ms. Winkler is hereby ordered by this court to not phone, mail, email, text, IM, smoke signal, telegraph, semaphore, correspond with, speak to, or in any way address Corey Waters. Furthermore, she is forbidden to approach within 500 feet of his person, whether at home, in school, at the mall, at some awesome party, or on the public way. If she wishes to go back or ahead in time alone or with her father and alter the dynamics of the relationship so Corey, again, wants to be in her presence, I wish them both the best of luck. He wrapped his gavel once sharply, ending the legal proceeding and beginning our present ordeal.